Uh, here's an example of um, a project that I'm doing right now in Afghanistan. I've been in Afghanistan for the past five years, and as you may know, Afghanistan is very cold in the wintertime, very hot in the summertime, and there's no wood, uh, no trees. So uh, I met this gentleman by the name of Sanu Kaji uh, in, um, in, uh, in Kathmandu, Nepal, and he introduced me to the concept of fuel briquettes. So I brought Sanu over to Afghanistan in March of 2008. So the bottom line is that we are using essentially waste. Now, Kabul, by the way, is a city the size of Chicago with no wastewater treatment system. So what do you do with all that waste? Well, most of the time, waste stays where it is. In fact, it has contaminated the first aquifer located 300 feet, 100 meters below the ground, which is another crime against humanity, knowing that how many hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent in Afghanistan. But other than that, so, um, so essentially using waste, uh, that includes paper, cardboard, sawdust, corn husk, um, shells of, um, of nuts and so on that you find in Afghanistan, all the stuff that, except plastic, uh, you can essentially combine it, press it, and form those briquettes. The briquette that you see there at the bottom left there will burn for about 20 minutes. Next slide. So that was in March 2008. In July of 2008, we had started a business. Total cost of starting the business was $20,000. We took 20 street children with the help of Unislight. So that was in March 2008. In July of 2008, we had started a business. Total cost of starting the business was $20,000. We took 20 street children with the help of UNICEF from the streets of Kabul, children, men, young men, who were exploited sexually. They were in a prostitution ring. We took them out. We trained them how to make briquettes. We built essentially four presses and we also built some presses for handicapped people, as you can see on the top right. We changed the design of the briquette so that beggars can get a job. They make $50 a, day, a month, compared to most people in Afghanistan who make less than $1 a day. They work three to four hours in the morning, and in the afternoon they go to school for three hours, okay? So it's an earn-learn program. We studied that in July of 2008. Uh, the bread that you see here is from one of the bakers in Kabul during Ramadan last year. He used the briquettes instead of wood, which is very expensive, and was able to reduce the price of bread by 30%. My friends, this is using trash, not fancy stuff, and I was glad to go with those kids there to pick up the trash. I was pretty much the only PhD in the world there that was picking up trash in the streets of Kabul. And it worked. Now we have 80 two children, mostly women, I would say two-thirds women, young girls, and oh, young women, and boys, and we are expanding. There are, are 60,000 children in the streets of Kabul, begging in the streets of Kabul every day. So how do we reach out to the people at the bottom of the pyramid? How do we reach out essentially to people so that they can be employed? And that model, by the way, can be used anywhere in the world where there is trash. A side effect of this project, in addition to creating jobs, is to clean the city. Next. Here's an example. A few months ago, actually months ago, I was in, um, we studied Engineers Without Borders Israel, Engineers Without Borders Palestine, and Engineers Without Borders Jordan and I visited all three groups during the summer. And here is a village called Susia in the West Bank. It's a, it's a village of Bedouins, uh, mostly Muslim people. You can see the top left there, here's the village. They live in tents during the summertime and literally live in caves, like cave people, in the wintertime. Uh, at the back there, you have a Jewish settlement. Three or four days before I got there, some people from the Jewish settlement burnt one quarter of that tent with people in there. Uh, again, not all problems are technical, my friends. Many of them, if all problems were technical, we would have solved them by now. So in that case, it is obviously geopolitical. Nevertheless, a group of young Israelis there uh, worked on that project for, it's not Engineers Without Borders, but it's another group there, a local NGO, and I accompanied them essentially using solar panels and using a wind turbine that spins 365 days, 24 seven, they are able to provide all the energy necessary for that community at the middle there of the desert. In fact, what struck me there was there was one big refrigerator. You are surrounded by an entire desert there. They don't put Coca-Cola or fresh drinks into, into the refrigerator. They use the refrigerator to store essentially uh, cheese, milk, and so on, things that they can sell 
uh, also vaccines um, that can be used essentially to improve the community. Total cut of this project, $40,000. And here is a community that is able to get back on its feet. The picture there on the bottom right was taken about a week ago where they also installed in a cave, in a cave, like the cave people, some solar energy so that the winter time they have enough electricity. Essentially, they have light. Light, the kids can go to school if they're not beaten up by uh, the other group out there on the way to school because that has happened a lot over the past uh, few months. Uh, they can go to school. Uh, uh, they can uh, make some living and so on and so forth. Total cost of this project, 40,000. If we can do it here at the middle of the desert of the West Bank, then I do believe we can do it anywhere else. Next. Um, so, in conclusion, I just want to quote this uh, quote from uh, Albert Einstein, significant problems we face cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. And I think that applies not only to energy, water, but also to poverty reduction uh, in the world today. The bottom line is that we have the means and the know-how to provide the developing world with practical and sustainable energy solutions, period. Short of that, I think it will be, we will be lying to the entire planet. The problems are not technical. So several questions for you, several questions for discussion. How do we transition from biomass to modern fuels? How do we provide equity in energy between all those countries that have too much power and the countries that don't have enough power? What is the role of science and technology in addressing the needs of five billion people, five billion people whose job is to try to stay alive by the end of the day? Engineering today has only been addressing the needs of one billion people on this planet, yet we do not train our young people today to address the needs of five billion people. In fact, I started a center, we got a large endowment at the University of Colorado dedicated to understanding how do we practice engineering in a developing world? It's based on technology, policy issues, security, public health, and social entrepreneurship. All five components, all our students when they graduate from our program are exposed to five components and the interrelationship between those five components. What is the new mindset that needs to be endorsed by everybody, both the developed and the developing world, to provide affordable energy, equitable energy, decentralized energy, reliable energy, efficient and appropriate energy solutions to the planet. Again, affordable, equitable, decentralized. As we heard before, there's no way that people will be on a grid in Africa. There's no way we can build a grid. In fact, let me, let me be challenging. We can build a better system of energy in Africa than we have in the United States. What about the challenge there? In fact, I can see that if we get our job right with the help of our colleagues from the developing world, we can teach the so-called developed world how to be more efficient in what they are doing. This is a big challenge, and it is essentially rooted in a concept of humility, respect, learning from each other. We are dealing with cultures on this planet who have been here for thousands of years, who know how to deal with natural resources. The sad part is that we are not listening to them. It is about time that we change our mindset there. Affordable, equitable, decentralized, reliable, efficient, and appropriate technology. If we cannot do that, if we cannot change our production consumption model, if we are going to, next slide, if we can, if we are, the best we can do is to export the production consumption model that I presented before to the rest of the world. There's not enough planets out there, period. 